Sister Cherie and Sister Angela and Sister Becca and all the people that are um, counting on us to sing and worship the Lord and be Him. Yes, I'd like for y'all to remember uh, Sister Og and Brother Og. Brother Og is better. He went to the hospital. Of course, we know that. And they sent him back home, but he was dehydrated and he needs to be rehydrated and. He's weak. Just pray for him. Pray for both of them and their family. Also, Sister Ray Smith, I heard that she, she let me know she was better after we prayed. So, thank the Lord for that, but, but she's still not completely well, if y'all remember her. Pray for her. 
they're going to come down here at the end of the month and we're going to get to meet them including Silas and Chloe their children so we're looking forward to that somebody else got a prayer request Lane, number six, and Sophie, Just their dog is has not eaten and drinking, so pray for her. That the Lord will heal that dog. Somebody else, he kept Brutus alive, didn't he? Did. <laughs> Neda. I remember all of my family. I uh, prayed for the McLeese family. They're friends that I went to college with, but uh, dad's in the hospital and really just need the Lord to stop. Okay. Someone else? Jesus. Let's remember Brother Henson. Pray for him to recover from that blow. And Lord, I, I know the Lord will, and he'll, yes, he'll heal his body. Praise the Lord. Anybody else need healing or anything else? Yeah, Sister Pam and Sister Vicki, both of them. Sister Pam has been sick. I haven't heard, but she's better. Also, um, yeah, Sister or Sister Rita and, and Sister Hannah. For Hannah's husband, has COVID. Chris. Chris, okay. Nehemiah? Thank you for your help and Right, I do thank you. Okay. Let's ask him to save others. Want to? Right. Help others. Praise the Lord. Anybody else this morning? Remember Bill. Remember Bill. <laughs> Remember Sister Barbara's girls. Especially Caitlin's going to have a baby pretty soon. Pray for. Pray for. Yes. How is your name? I mean, when I'm not working, it seems to be a little better because I'm not on it as much. So, mm -hmm. But when I'm working, it comes with the pressure on the okay. Let's pray for that the Lord will heal it completely. Yes. Anything else? Anybody else? Okay. Let's go to the Lord and pray right now. Mm -hmm.
How many, how many people like math in school? No, no. One, two, okay, good. 50 50, that's good. We're gonna, we're gonna look at some math today, I think, as we go through this and try to figure out. And I actually learned some new things this week as I was going through this. And we, we finished off last week, if I recall, we talked about the flat roof versus the peaked roof. I don't think we got much further than that, but we'll we'll figure this out. The tabernacle walls, right, when they when they put these together, we said there weren't exact dimensions, but we figured it out that it was some rough numbers. Because we had 20 planks at one and a half cubits each. So that gave me about 30 cubits along this way. Remember, the, the court was 50 cubits. But no, it was 100 cubits along this way. <coughs> I mean, 50 this way. And then the ends were a smaller dimension 
but if these were 30 cubits, then this would be about 10 cubits wide. Okay, where this was what? 50 cubits wide. So this isn't exactly drawn to scale. That's what I'm trying to say. There's a lot more room in here. This building is a lot smaller than what they're sort of picturing it in here. It really would have been almost just the back third of the courtyard. Okay. And then today we're going to talk about, we talked about this wall inside and how that was constructed. And then now I want to talk about the, the top area here, this covering that goes over top of these walls. Remember, all these walls, these were boards that were all overlaid with gold, right? So they were, they were something. I mean, we went inside, it was just an entirely gold room other than the artifacts and the one hanging here between uh, what they call the veil and the front curtains. Everything else was just gold. Can you imagine going into that room? That's amazing. Just think about that, right? And this is just gold that they just happened to have around. I mean, this wasn't like they had a, a mint or a, a, a place to, to mine gold. or This is just what they happened to carry out with them from Egypt, right? To make all of these things, the silver, the gold, the everything. And it's interesting to me that God had the Egyptians to give them exactly how much they would need to make all this, right? But it shows how much stuff the Egyptian gave them when they left to try to get them to leave. And we talked about the peaked angle, and we're going to theorize that the, the angle of the roof, bring this back out of the way, that the angle of the roof is probably at an angle, scholars think it was, it was at a peak, so that this angle here is about 70 degrees. That would give them enough pitch and slope on the roof that it wouldn't have any problem and when you start looking at the dimensions of the curtains, which we're going to look at today, that's why I said the math is going to come in, um, you've got the building here, right? And then you've got a certain amount of overhang here. So what happened was it was peaked at this, but then when it got to here, it kind of slanted downward like this, right? And then there, it would be fastened to the ground. So it didn't really, it wasn't really covering the building. I mean, like, I don't even know that it was even really touching the building at parts. It was almost like it was isolated from the building and this tent. And the important part that we're gonna see is when we talk about how they were stitched together, it's gonna leave a little bit of an opening right up in here, in the top part of the sanctuary. Remember. It, it was only walls. They didn't talk about wood that was used for a roof. Okay? So this isn't there. You got me? It's just the two th or the four. The just the walls, walls. The three walls and then the front veil. Right? You can't really draw that. But anyway, you get my idea. And then I have this roof covering over the building which was needed because there was no roof, there was no physical roof. Um, now this one picture here shows beams going across this way, but the, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that. Remember the walls were on the sockets and the tenons. And we talked about the tenons and the mortises, right? So they were pegged into the ground that way and then they were shorn up with cords to hold the walls up. So what would they need roof trusses for? They didn't have a roof. The roof of the tabernacle wasn't really connected to the tabernacle walls in any way that we can see. So each side of the roof would be about nine cubits wide and then when you added up all of the different 
roof sections then it would make up the required covering so it would cover the whole thing and we don't know that it went all the way to the ground matter of fact we don't think it did like it would actually have stopped here and then it would have been tied to the ground with a cord this way so the roof covering didn't actually go all the way to the ground they didn't want the roof covering touching the ground right and if you look at one of the other things that caused me to really promote this sort of peaked roof theory is and that it wasn't a flat roof was if you add up the dimensions then the the dimensions of the roof covering would have been longer than this whole thing and it would have gone all the way if it just gone down the walls right and just been a flat roof and i i lose and i increase all that fabric then all of a sudden it'd be draped and hanging on on the ground that wasn't going to happen okay couldn't touch the ground. The ground was sinful, dirty. So the, there was a roof canvas that was stretched tight across the ridge. So, so the roof canvas, the first piece, would go and was stretched tight across these pieces, and that would help also with the top stabilization of the top of the building and the walls. Now we keep the whole thing from just sort of parting under the strain of the cords. And then there was another width of a curtain that was folded across the bottom part at each gable. So where it came to the end, then it would fold underneath and it would create this opening. And the opening was important because, again, we had flames and, and, and incense and smoky things and going on inside the building. So if this were like this picture, there'd be no place for that to go out. Not to mention the fact that I've got a walled structure with walls and veils and a tight covering. If I make a tight covering over the roof with no openings whatsoever, there's no windows for ventilation, but there's also no room for any light, ambient light to come in from the outside. Be very dark inside of that thing. Not to mention smoky. You got the candelabra going, you got the, the altar of incense, which was designed to generate smoke and perfume smoke. Sister Annie? I just had a thought, my mind goes crazy. Um, how did they, what's the corridor that That's a good question. The Bible doesn't really say other than it would have been stretched. So unless they had something on the front and then a cord that went along the seam of the top. But these were designed into two different... Um, yeah, there were actually five panels for each side and they were stitched together. They were, um, each panel was 28 cubits long, 28 cubits and four cubits wide. And then each one had 50 of these little loops in it. And then the next panel would also have 50 loops, but then on this side, it would have 50 holes So what they did was they took the, the loops and they'd fold these together, they'd stick these loops through these holes, and then they'd put a little uh, tenon in there to peg it. So, so you'd have the one tent material would have the hole and then the loop would come up through it right to the other piece and then this is one piece and that's the other piece. And then up in here, they just put like a, a rod or a peg to hold the loop. They called it a tachet, T-A-C-H-E-T. -E <clears throat> now, If the peak were at 70 degrees, 
then the distance from here to the peak was about, if you do the math, it's about seven and a half cubits. It's a pretty tall peak, right? So Sister Annie's right, there had to be something in there to fill that in, right? But the gable curtain was going to rise about three cubits. So you'd still have four and a half cubits of that triangular opening on the end. So it's a pretty good hole. It would almost fill the triangle, but not totally. So the opening at the peak was for light and for ventilation, as I said. It served as a window and also as a chimney. Now, if they just left that opening completely open and full, it would allow too much weather to come in, right? So it was just a small opening. It wasn't um, a lot. <clears throat> and they didn't want a lot of um, wind coming into the tabernacle either because you had a thing that we haven't talked about yet, but the candelabra is the, um, the like what's called the menorah, right? Which is the the light, the thing that had to stay lit, continue. Remember the Samuel story? Yeah, it'd be like blowing out your birthday cake every day. Right? <laughs> this is a desert place. It's a lot of wind. Now, these triangular pieces of cloth were tacked in between the two layers of the roof canvas, canvas and they were called the gores, or gores in the Hebrew. And those layers were at the corner of the eaves and they would be extended above the tops of the planks. So they would be here and here. So you'd have these gorezes that would go across like this. And that let the um, eaves be extended above the tops of the planks. So then you'd also have a ventilation path here also. Almost like the soffits on your house, on the roof of your house. What's well, amazing, this was, what, 4,000 years ago, <laughs> right? I mean, they're, they're building all this the same way we're building houses today for the most part. That would also take the um, wind pressure away from the roof, so the roof wouldn't have to bear all of that, right? There was a way to vent that out. Um, there's another Hebrew word, it's called kafal. It's K A P H A L. And that means, actually, let's look at that. Verse. Uh, Exodus 26 and 9. <clears throat> and thou shalt couple five curtains by themselves and six curtains by themselves, and thou shalt double the sixth curtain in the forefront of the tabernacle. That word translated double is this is this word kafal which means to wrap around but it's also used to repeat or duplicate or to double so they would double that over right and what it meant was the sixth curtain that was laid down was doubled over by reversing it or folding it in half and that would give a little more security and weather protection. And it was done to the other curtains too, most likely, but it specifically mentions this sixth curtain. So the whole roof, in practice, was like a big double canvas in its makeup. And I'm talking about the first two layers of the roof cover. That's all I'm talking about here. The lower edge 
of each sheet was securely buttoned over the curtains and the knobs of the walls so that it would fasten to it and then through those loops And the loops were threaded through the eyelets of the curtains, kind of like that. Okay. Look at verse four in chapter twenty-six. And thou shalt make loops upon of blue upon the edge of one curtain from the selvage in the coupling, and likewise thou shalt make in the uttermost edge of another curtain in the coupling of the second. Fifty loops shalt thou make in one curtain, and fifty loops shalt thou make in the edge of the curtain that is in the coupling of the second that the loops may take hold of one another. Okay, just like that. In verse 7, Thou shalt make curtains of goat's hair to be covering upon the tabernacle. Eleven curtains shalt thou make. The length of one curtain shall be thirty cubits, and the breadth of one curtain four cubits. And eleven curtains shall be all of one measure. So there's eleven of them. So later on it talks about Five curtains, actually in verse 9, that's your couple five curtains by themselves and six curtains by themselves. That makes up 11. Told you it would be a lot of math today. And the 11th curtain was folded double, right, for more protection. And then there's different Hebrew words when they just talk about the edges in the translations they're actually two different he, Hebrew words that are going on on my wiper here Hebrew And it talks about these these two edges. One was the Safa, S A P H A H with an accent, and that was the long edge. And the Katsa was the short edge. Are those words where they have? Those are the Hebrew translations of the word edge or border. And they use them interchangeably, but when they translate them, they just said edge or border. But in the Hebrew, they're actually different words to show the long edge versus the short edge. Right? So it was even just pointing out that it was more descriptive in the actual Hebrew than it is in the translation a little bit. Um, so that they knew exactly how to do that. So the Safa was the lip edge or the um, long or lengthwise edge. And the Katsa was the endmost or the uttermost edge. And there were 50 loops and it didn't mean they were all on the single edge. It was more likely that the curtain had 50 loops distributed between the two edges. Right, but we don't really know. They, they didn't really state that exactly. Um, and it would also show how the curtains were doubled and, and fastened over one another. Right, so the loops would not only bind the curtains together, but then they would bind the full sheet over to the second sheet. So the two would be almost like laminated, right? And the roof was sustained by an extension upward of the central doorpost in the front and the rear of the building. So that would say how it was peaked. So, so what they're saying is there was in the, at the top of the back in the middle, there was another post that went up. And that would be what the, what the covering would drape over. And where was that? Uh, I don't have a scripture reference. I'm trying to remember. There was talk about... I don't remember where I saw it, but... That's okay. But like you said, you'd have to be. There would have to be for it to be peaked at all. 
Right. Right. Um, uh, and again, those were just um, keeping those alive. I'm trying to see. It really doesn't have them. But beyond those, there have been no other need for any ropes or poles or posts or ridge supports or anything else required based upon the design and based upon the materials that they used. Because the roof itself, the coverings themselves, fastened to each other. Did you notice that in verse, where was that? Verse 5 at the end, that the loops may take hold of one another. So the, within the roof fabric, right, it would, it would hold and bind to itself. And then the second layer, for the first two layers, actually then connected together also to themselves, right? To make a real covering protection. And they were made of ram's hides. Um, or goat hide, goat hide, excuse me. And one was be the fur on the outside, right? And the, the fur, this is the fur, the fur. It would go on the outside of the wall to protect it. And then the other one would, the skin would go down. So it'd be skin to skin, right? They fasten all that together. But they didn't fasten it to the building. It was just fastened to itself, okay? That's all they required for it to do. Now, <clears throat> here's where things get a little crazy. <laughs> um, the materials that they used to do these with and the colors that they used to do these roof coverings with are of significance. They weren't just um, selected at random. Um, the first covering or curtain was made of linen, the Bible says. And it was a sign of purity. It's also a sign of the church. Not just any church, but this would be God's church. This would be the bride, right? This was the, the element that they wanted to protect. So it was made out of this real fine linen. Think of your uh, Egyptian 600 count thread sheets, right? Real, real good stuff. 600, Brother Don. I'm up to 1,200 now. Get out of here. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what we all became so infatuated with thread count, but <laughs> um, but it was twisted for many strands. It was also um, it was colored in a way um, to denote this um, the entrance, similar to the entrance with the blue and the purple and the scarlet. And they would be dyed, the threads would be dyed, and then woven into the fabric. Right, so we have blue, red, and purple. Now, blue indicates heaven. I think blue was my favorite color for some reason. Yeah, right? <laughs> heaven. Um, Red indicates what? Sacrifice. Blood, right? And then purple is royalty. Royalty. Or deity. says with cherubims. Does that mean that they embroidered? They did. So it was decorated with these figures of cherubims. Now, a cherubim has been sort of evolving into this little cute chubby cheek baby that's 
Got no clothes on and wings. The actual cherubim descriptions are much more terrifying <laughs> than the little baby in the Gerber commercial. Okay, so um, <laughs> what exactly is the cherubim? So cherubim is a plural word for cherub, which is defined as a celestial angelic being in a spiritual realm. They're almost always associated with the holiness of God. Remember Adam and Eve? When, when Adam and Eve got cast out of the garden, what did God do? He took his cherubim and put them at the gate at the east of Eden and would not let them come back. Now, so it was defending the way to the tree of life for them. Right? That was their barrier. Now, do you think that was a cute little chubby baby with little puffy cheeks? No. No, it's a terrifying thing that we keep them away, okay? Um, sometimes we think of them as those cute little chubby things with wings, but, <laughs> but look at Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1, um, we'll start at verse 5. Also, out of the midst of thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the appearance, they had the likeness of a man. Everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings, and their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. They sparkled like the color of burnished brass. They had hands of a man under the wings on four sides, and they four in their faces and their wings. And their wings were joined one to another, and they turned not when they went. They went every one straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, they, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, they, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, and they four also had the face of an eagle. That doesn't sound like a little chubby baby with wings. Um, now he's at the River Chebar, verse 3. Some people think that's where they got the name Cherubim from, Chebar. I don't know if that's correct or not. Um, but that's the description of what a cherubim looked like. Um, look at Revelation chapter 4. Uh, verse 6. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. In the midst of the throne, around about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. The first beast was like a lion, the second was like a calf, the third had the face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts, each of them had six wings about him. They were full of eyes within. They had rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts gave out glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever. So, so those beasts, those in the same descriptions that Ezekiel had are in Revelation, right? The eagle and the, the calf and the man. and the... But they're not resting day and night praising God. That's what they're doing. And, and the faces are kind of important also. So the, the man, that side of it, that face spoke reason. That spoke um, of the affections and all the things that encompass us as humans. And the lion was strong, fierce, royal. That was the king. And the ox was a patient laborer, strong, but a servant. Right? So the lion and the king... But the ox is the servant. 
Then you got the eagle, the divine bird, majestic, flies above storm, swift, powerful, has no equal. Right? And then you combine all them together and how they all relate to man, right? How we have a king and we have a servant and how we have a majestic bird who understands all things human. And all those rolled up and together were the cherubim. The, the second covering that went on was also of goat hair and was slightly larger in size. Um, now most, most of the tents back in those days were made out of those goat hair materials. And we think of canvas tents today, we think of a beige looking, but this was actually almost black or very dark brown, right? The goat hides were very dark in color. And um, and those were woven together, and the curtain was that um, the color right. Is, uh, it was obviously for protection of the elements from the gold walls of the tabernacle, right? But also, it sort of the drab color, the brown or black, sort of demoted or promoted a sense of humility or poverty. Right? You think of um, like a cursed sin offering. The next material that they used, well, and because it was kind of around that piece of it, around the, um, what was the thing I found? I found another reference and I left it at home. Um, but think of it as the church that, you know, again, needs to be protected, right? And so the next layer, which would be the third layer, was the first of the two protective layers. And it was made of ram skins dyed red. Now the ram is the uh, full-grown male sheep of the flock, right? That's the big ram. And it also denoted a substitutional sacrifice. Do you remember when, excuse me, um, the sacrifice of Isaac, right? Abraham, knife over him. The angel says, no, don't do this. What did God do? God provided what? A ram. A ram in the thicket. Now, I read that story and I go, how is that ram going to get stuck in that? Rams are big. They are huge animals. They are not going to get tangled up in a little weed. Right? <laughs> that would be a pretty big thicket. But, that's the way God worked it out. And, but those ram skins were very thick and durable. I mean, they were tough, tough stuff. Rams were tough, tough animals. The shepherd may have one or two rams for an entire flock of sheep. Okay? They're not like plentiful animals. So this was a high-end animal to be made into this. Now, again, we said that, that the Israelites had an abundance of flocks and herds. Right? The Bible tells us that. So they would have used their rams, and that was a big sacrifice for them to give up their rams. The other part was that it was ram skins dyed red. Right? And it's covering over the linen. The church. His blood covers us. Right? See the symbolism here? The rams, in the eyes of the Jews, were that substituted animal. So it's also a, a precursor of Jesus Christ. Right? Who was the sacrificial animal that covers us with his blood. Right? So it was not only for physical protection, right? But it was also making a statement. 
of sacrifice covering the church, protecting us. The, the ram skins were dyed red to represent the sacrifice of the substitute, the same way that Jesus was a substitutional sacrifice for our sins. So, so we've got two layers of this stuff. One of the layers is dyed with this stuff to represent these things. And then over the top of that, we've got the ram skin. dyed red right so you got two of these and I got one of these and there's one more um, and there's a lot of questions about this last one let's look at um, 24 or 20 Exodus 26 and verse 14. Fingers to work. 26. There we go. And thou shalt make a covering for the tents of ram skins dyed red, and a covering above of badger's skins. Badger's skins. Now, you say the word badger, Brother David, you think of like the honey badger. It's not what it is. That's one of the confusing parts of this. The other translation is um, almost like uh, sea cows or manatees. Some say seals. Yeah. Some say dolphins. Yeah. I know. And there's another one. Oh, what's the name of it? See, that's why I wanted that other scripture. Um, Door. Uh, uh, there's another. It's another name for this. It's like a do pro or something. I can't remember what it said. But there was another similar word to a manatee. It's the same thing. But what about what about these sea bearing animals? What do we know about them? Everybody ever touched one of them? I've actually touched. I've actually touched all of those actually in one point of my life. <laughs> um, they are kind of uh, rubbery, I guess. Waterproof, yeah, certainly, yeah. right? I mean, they live in the water. Um, very thick hide, kind of. I mean, if I was thinking about something that I wanted to cover over the whole thing to protect it from the elements, that would be a good material, right? So that's what they did. They took these and they, they created this sort of real thick, durable covering with the hides of these animals. Now, where in the world they got the hides from these in the middle of the desert, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> except that, except that Mount Sinai, which is where Moses got the instructions, was right next to the Red Sea, because they just come across the Red Sea. right? So Mount Sinai's location is not very far from the Gulf of Aqaba and the Red Sea depending on where you think Mount Sinai is. But there was sea available when they were constructing this. Now, once they started traveling, they wouldn't be able to get replacement materials because they were then in the middle of the Sinai Peninsula in the, des in the desert. So there was no getting more of that, right? So it had to last. It had to last. But that was, that was what they did. They took all those materials and they took this heavy thick, insulated, waterproof covering and put over the whole thing for somebody walking to the church not listening. Yeah. No, somebody else. Oh, is there a Jeep? There's another Jeep. Oh, oh somebody in a wheelchair. Yeah, we have some other guests coming. Can we help them in front of the Hey, Brother Cecil. Come on in. 
Yeah. Give me your hand up. You got it? I got it. Just one arm. Minute. There you are, sir. Sit right on that chair right there. Yeah, I can't walk very far on this leg yet. Probably, You're all right, sir. Stuff they done Always to glad it. to see you, brother. Yeah. Okay, we can do this right here. Um, yeah, we just, if you want to take it around that corner, um, take it right back in the kitchen. That would be great. Thank you, sir. Okay. We're talking about the tabernacle, Cecil. All right. All the stuff and how they built it. and So the... Um, Hebrew is very vague in exactly which animal it was that made this top layer of the roof covering. The Hebrew word they call it is tak. Let me get it right. Tahash. Tahash. <laughs> and, and the translation of that word actually works out to like giant unicorn. So that just really mystifies sort of the whole what the last animal was, right? Um, so we don't really believe it was a giant unicorn, but most most people think that it was those elements of those. Um, but King James Bible clearly denotes badger skins, so we'll focus on badger skins. But they were the outer covering. This was the covering that everybody saw, right? It was tough, it was durable, but it was very plain in appearance. There's no fancy artwork or colors or cherubims or things like that inscribed on it, right? It's a very simple outer covering. No fancy dyes or colors. And this all speaks of Christ, but in relationship of Christ to man. So he protects us with the sacrifice of his blood, the, the ram's hides dyed red, and he's covering the church. Right? The purity of the church. And they didn't want the tabernacle to have a lot of outward beauty. Because what was on the outside of the tabernacle was not what was important. Right? It was what was on the inside of the tabernacle that was important. So when Christ came to earth, he pitched his humble tabernacle. Right? It wasn't showy. Christ wasn't big, flashy, showy guy. He did some miracles, but he wasn't the attention seeker that you know people thought Messiah would be. Right? He was very humble among men. And he wasn't big and strong like Goliath, right? He wasn't um, lavish and royal apparel or anything like that. He was simple. Um, look at Isaiah chapter 53. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Just a simple man. Now, I'm trying to find my place. I closed my book. <laughs> this one. Yeah. So to the Jews, Jesus was a plain, coarse badger skin. Very simple. And he's also that way today in our present world. He's just who he is. But to those of us who are his, he's so much more. Because we're not looking at the outside of Jesus, the outside. We're looking at the inside, the tabernacle. We're seeing the holiest of what he has for us, right? The lily of the valley, the fairest among 10,000. But we can see beyond that, that outer covering of 
badger skins, and we can see into the most holy place because he's right here, right? The veil has been torn. Any questions on the outer covering? All right. I don't have time to get into the inner coverings for right now, so I'm going to stop there. But I do want to share something else with you. Kind of go back out into the courtyard for a second. This is something I just, just learned last night. You're never too old to learn something. So initially, we talked about this area over here with the altar and altar sacrifice. And um, we didn't really get into all of the different types of offerings, but in my reading last night, I happened to go through that. Um, the first thing I want to show you, look at Leviticus chapter 3, I think it is. Well, first let's look at verse 2, or chapter 2. It says, And when any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, a meat offering. Now, I've read the Bible now, I'm on my 41st time reading it. So I've read the scripture at least 41 times. I never realized the meat offering was not really meat. It was not flesh. It was made of flour and oil. Right? Keep reading. His offering shall be of fine flour, and he shall pour oil upon it, and put frankincense thereon. And he shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, and he shall take thereout his handful of flour thereof, and the oil thereof, with all the frankincense thereof. And the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar. That altar is actually in here. It's this altar of incense. That's different. That's different. So a meat offering is not really meat. I always thought it was just meat and then bread. That's what I, right. you know, read. Right. That's meat. what I thought. Right. Well, that's because we're, we're used to that, meat and potatoes, right? It's like, that's the way we do it. Now, the other piece which was interesting to me, I started going on with this, and it says, um, uh, let me see if I can find exactly where it is. It's a lot of gross stuff in here, but um, all right, chapter four, um, verse three. If a priest that is anointed to do sin according to the sin of the people, let him bring for his sin which he has sinned a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering. Now, a bullock that's a like a bull, it's a ox, it's an animal, right, without blemish. And the priest that is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 4. And he shall bring the bullock to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, right? And and he shall, shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head and kill the bullock before the Lord. And the priest that is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. Right? And then it says he's going to sprinkle it here. Right? The priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. That's here. Right? And the priest shall put the same blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord. That's this thing. The altar of incense. which is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering. So the rest of the blood gets poured out here. I never figured this out before last night. Then look what happened. This is interesting. And the two kidneys, oh, you should take from it the fat of the bullock for sin offering, the fat that covers the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards. Sorry, it's gross. And the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them is by the flanks. And the caul, which is another fatty deposit, above the liver, with the kidneys, he shall take away. 
As it was taken from the bullock of the sacrifice of peace offerings, the priest shall put them upon the altar of burnt offering. But it's not the bullock. It's just those pieces that he took out of the bullock. And he puts those on this right here. Not the whole animal. The skin of the bullock and all his flesh with his head and with his legs and his innards and his dung, sorry, even the whole bullock which he shall carry forth without the camp to a clean place where the ashes are poured out. Now, is that anywhere in this picture? No, it's without the camp. And so I think about that. Why would they do that? Well, the bullock represented the sin of the person. And later, it can also relate to the sin of the community of people. Like if the whole congregation sinned unknowingly, they could sacrifice one bullock for the whole thing. They wouldn't have to do like a thousand, right? So, yeah, so it was like a group thing. But, but the, the, the animal itself had sin, so could the sinful animal be brought into here? No. They would just carry in the inward parts with the blood. Right again, the blood was sacrificed. They would burn that here. They would take the rest of the bullock outside of the camp and burn it there, where they pour out the ashes. Because sin couldn't enter this area. All the priests that entered this area had to be consecrated and sinless. Right? Now, we keep saying this maps into the Jesus and the whole thing. Where was Jesus crucified? Outside the camp. Outside the camp. Why? Because he took his sin upon himself. He took our sin upon himself. He couldn't enter here, even though he was the high priest. Right? He couldn't enter here. He couldn't enter into the holy place because he was filled with sin when he was hung on the cross. He bore our sins at Calvary. And Calvary had to be outside the camp. Right? Uh, look at Hebrews 13. So I think I found this in there last night. Sister Lee reminded me of another scripture. 13. Right near the end of Hebrews. I just got to remember which. Um, verse eleven: For those, for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Right? And then it says, Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name but to do good and to communicate forget not for with such sacrifices God is well pleased but all that happened without the gate and then later they talk about the um, the other uh, sacrifice the peace offering which was also an animal and it was the same thing. It said that the animal would be sacrificed in the same place as the sin offering. Right? It's back in that same area of Leviticus. And so, so there were certain things that were sacrificed here that we talked about a few weeks ago. But there were certain things that were not. Parts of it were. right? Parts of it were sprinkled here, poured out here, burned on here. But a bulk of the animal was burned without the camp. Right? In the same way that Jesus suffered without the gate. Amen? Alright, and so next week we're going to talk about some of the interior hangings.
in this building, along with some of these elements like the candelabra and the table of showbread.
page 30.
I sang that song when I was a girl before I got saved. I went to the altar many times, but I didn't get saved. I didn't get saved till I was 26 and was in desperate need of the Lord. And then He saved me. But I had, I had sung that song. I mean, I, you know, when you're a girl, you choose the songs you want to sing. Gloria chose that song, didn't you? No. You choose the songs you want to sing and you try to, I tried, I learned to play it. I learned to sing it. Because that's really what I wanted more than anything else. I wanted Jesus to abide with me. I don't want him to come and go. I didn't want him to be up on his throne and me down here just trying my best to make it. I didn't want that. I wanted him to live with me. I want him to do that. I feel like he is doing that. But there's a lot to learn because we're not just in this world with us and the Lord. We've got the devil around us trying to deceive us. And uh, we have to be careful of what we believe, who we believe. So that's what I'm, what we do. We we weigh uh, experiences and circumstances against the Word and against the Spirit of the Lord that comes to us and leads and guides us into all truth. So this morning I wanted to uh, preach a message about, and it's a lot for for. Uh, maybe young Christians, or maybe somebody that really has never heard this, I want to preach a message about how to establish a bond between you and God. A bond. A bond is something that cements. It unites and cements things together. That's what a bond is. If you've got some really good glue and you need to stick two things together, it's nice, isn't it, if it does stick. <laughs> so nice if it sticks. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about to establish something that sticks between us and God. Something that bonds us together. Where you know it's not a, a matter of you guessing, you think, you hope that you have a real strong relationship with the Lord. It's not that kind. It's actually that it is actually there. You're actually bonded with the Lord. And so I'm going to just name a few things. But first I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 22. There is one person in the Bible besides Jesus, one normal person because he was born without sin but this man was born in sin just like we all of us are it was his name was David so I wanted to look at David and what he had to say in chapter 22 of second Samuel and David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul and he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. The God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation. My high tower and my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall be I be saved from mine enemies. When the waves of death compassed me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God. And he did hear my voice out of his temple, and my cry did enter into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven moved and shook because he was wroth. Then went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. 
he bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. And he made darkness pavilion round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Now I'm going to go on down to verse 17. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them that hated me. For they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me. And as for his statute, statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also upright before him and had kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore the Lord hath recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyesight. With the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful. And with the upright man thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure thou wilt show thyself pure, and with the froward thou wilt show thyself unsavory. And the afflicted people thou wilt save, but thine eyes are upon the haughty, that thou mayest bring them down. For thou art my lamp, O Lord, and the light the Lord will lighten my darkness. Brother Jose, will you pray for the message? Lord, we ask you to bless this service. We ask you to bless this preaching. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So David delighted himself in the Lord, and the Lord, he said, because he delighted in me. They had a bond. They had a bond. David had a bond with God. He had a bond with him that even though he sinned with Bathsheba and had Uriah the Hittite killed. That bond was not broken. <laughs> he had a bond. God had given him that bond. God had helped him to look in his word even after all of that. God put that aside, put that a, a away from him. And David kept on serving the Lord. David went on to serve the Lord even more. At the, at the end of his life. So David found, he found where the temple was going to be born, uh, built. He was able to start the building of the temple because God delighted in him and he delighted in God. So I'm going to just give you a few pointers today about how to establish a bond between you and God. The first one I'm going to tell you is pray no matter what. Pray no matter what. You can look in the Psalms and you can see David praying even when he was guilty before God and asking God to cleanse him from that unrighteousness to give him back his sweet spirit. You can see that no matter what, David kept on praying. He kept on asking God to be with him, to forgive him, to help him, to be His and let Him be His. Let me be yours and you be mine. No matter what. Just pray no matter what. doesn't matter what goes on, what happens. It doesn't matter how guilty you might feel or how unworthy you might feel. You go on and you talk it over with the Lord. You tell Him about it. You give Him uh, yourself. You let Him see your face looking up to Him saying, I don't understand all this that's going on but I'm still looking to you I'm still believing that you're going to watch over me, you're going to help me you're going to see me through this I'm going to pray no matter what hallelujah, that's what David did he prayed no matter what he just went on being God's he messed up but he went on being God's he tried to carry the temple in in a new cart and Uzzah tried to steady that cart and Uzzah died right there. And David was afraid of God then. He was afraid of Him. But he got the Bible and got the Scriptures and looked it up and realized 
He was supposed to have the priest carry the ark. So he did it the right way. And when he did it the right way, he knew it was the right way. And then he danced before the ark as it came into the town. Hallelujah. With all of his might. He wasn't ashamed to say, I messed up, but now I've got it right. And now I want to rejoice in you again, Father. I know you'll forgive me. I know you'll help me. I know you'll be with me. Hallelujah. He depended on that bond that he and God had. Praise God. He believed in that bond. Some of you are just starting out with God and you wish you had a, a real great bond with God. You wish that you could feel that great assurance that you and God are very strong together and it's very good between you and Him. Well, you've got to build that bond. You've got to let God build that bond with you. You know, if you come to church on Sunday and then you forget about God the rest of the week and then come back, or even come on Wednesday and forget about Him all that other time. That's not building that bond. You're building the bond when you're riding to work and you're crying out to Him, Sister Barbara, aren't you? You're building that bond, hallelujah, when you're at home and somebody asks you to pray and you're the first one to say, I'm praying. I'm seeking God for you. Whew. I'm going to call on Him every day. I'm going to let Him be in my life. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Okay, this is another thing you can do to establish a bond between you and God. You can give Him your tithe and offerings. Sister Linda, money? Y'all don't even take up an offering. I know we don't when there's nobody here to give it to. But I'm going to tell you something. When you begin to support God's work with your tithe, and offerings. You begin to do that. You are establishing a bond between you and Him. If He knows you're putting your money where your mouth is. It's not just a pretend. Lord, here's my tenth. I didn't make that much this week, but it's less. It's less, but it is a tenth of what I've got. Alright. And then next week, here comes more. Why? Because you are keeping that bond between you and God. The bond is, every time I get some money, I give you a part of it, Lord. And I realize that every time I give you a part of it, Lord, you bless what I have left. I give, you bless. You give me more. I give you more. You bless more. On and on and on. I had an uncle that wasn't saved a lot of his life. But all his life, he tithed. He gave to the Lord the tenth at least. And he never, never had a lack of anything. And at the end of his life, God saved him where he was in his deathbed just about. And he's in there shouting over God, loving God. Oh, why? He, he had all his life been building a bond that he really didn't understand. But that bond was he was giving his tithe. You know, there's sinner people that do that because they're honoring God and His work in this world with their means. They're giving his, their part to Him. So they're really building a bond they don't really understand. But you are, every time you give to the work of God, the tenth that you give, you know, of your finances, you're get, building that bond. So you pray no matter what. And you give Him your tithe. The next thing I'm going to do, one more, two more. This is the third one. Lean on His Word. Some people never take a verse and say, I'm going to hold to that verse. That's mine. You know, I started holding to a verse when I was about, I guess, I'm 11 or 12 years old. I mean, really holding to one. I'll tell you what it was. And you tell me if he has honored it. Psalm 40 and 1. 
I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Now, I guess that was the first verse in the Bible that I ever took as my own. I took it as my own. You know, I, brother, see, so I used to go to the altar and I didn't feel God. I didn't really know Him. I would pray. But this verse made me cry. It made me cry because I knew something in me was waiting patiently on the Lord. And when I would read that part where it says He inclined unto me, it was almost like He was beneath me and looking up into my face. It touched my heart and heard my cry. And He's done that for me. But I learned through that to let the Spirit in me, my own or His or something, whatever it was, lead me to a verse in the Bible that God wanted to help me with. By. And then take that verse, claim it for my own, and let it build a bond between me and the Lord. Since then, I have had many Many verses. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. According to the power that worketh in us. I feel the power of God in me. Ooh, what's he going to do? You know, you take, you get involved with God's Word. It's not just, Sister Yvonne, she's putting them on the on the Facebook, I see them. Yes. And I wonder, I do, honey, I wonder, how much does this verse mean to you? Are you meditating on it? Is it something that you're letting enter into your heart and become a part of you? Right. Are you? Some, some, some. I just want that to be happening. Because every time you grab a hold of God's Word, Bill, and you say, that's a verse for me, you're building a bond between you in the Lord. It's becoming more than just a book that doesn't really belong to you. It, beca it begins to belong to you. It is your book. Thank you, Jesus. So, lean on His Word. Be involved with His Word. You can't grab every verse <laughs> And it means something to you, I don't think. I've not tried that yet. But when you start to memorize a verse, and Sister Angela and I are memorizing verses, when you start to memorize one, all of a sudden it's almost like the light shines out of it. And you go, wow, look at that. Look at that. And you want it in your heart. You want to hide it in your heart. You want it to be a part of you. And that's building a bond between you and God. His Word. Brother Don said you've been studying for Sunday school lessons and studying for messages. Have you found that to be true that you're much more involved in the Word of God? Has it built, it's built a stronger bond. It will. Hallelujah. Okay, so lean on His Word. Hallelujah. The last one I'm going to do is Allow Him. Allow Him to do miracles for you. That's what I asked for today. We need, we need. Allow Him. You, you think, well, it's not up to me. Yes, it is. The Bible says Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. It was important for Abraham to open up his life for God to do things for him was important. You've got to open up your life for God to do things for you. You've got to be willing to experience miracles. But Sister Linda, I prayed for this and it didn't happen. Well, you still, the miracles are still in God's hands. It's not like we di dictate what miracles He does. 
But we come to the place where we realize you're in my life, Lord. So it must be that something wonderful is going to happen. And I'm open. I'm open to you to do miracles for me. There was a man named Cornelius that he prayed. He fasted. He gave alms. But he happened to be a Roman centurion that was outside of everything that God was doing for people. But he was building a bond, wasn't he, Brother Don? He was giving his finances. He was seeking, praying all the time. You know? He was listening to what the Jews had to say about God, which was somewhat leaning on His Word. Because he was finding out from the Jews who God really was. Well, so God told him to send for Peter. And He sent for him. And when he got there... There's Cornelius and he gathered all the people all around him. Was he open to miracles? Yes, he was open to whatever God wanted to do. He'd invited all of his family and all of his friends. And when Peter came in and started preaching, they were all looking like, oh, what's going to happen now? What's going to happen to us? We're willing, Lord. What you going to do? What you going to do? I am the balloon of the Whoa! Praise God. Sister Linda, why'd you do that? I was willing. Come on. I was willing to let him shout through me of his glory. Sometimes when the Holy Ghost speaks, I wish it was interpreted because I think it's saying glorious, wonderful, powerful, mighty, God Almighty. I mean, I believe it's a praise that I don't even know how to utter myself, but it comes out of me like a well springing up an artesian well, and I couldn't stop it if I wanted to. I'm telling you, you got to get to where you're willing for a miracle to happen. And when he got well, Cornelius was willing. He was ready. He was waiting. He'd been building bonds between him and God. You've been building bonds, haven't you? Yes. Your bonds have been building. Building those bonds. Get ready. Be willing to allow him to do a miracle for you. Get willing. Oh, how can I do that? Just look at things in a different way. Like, we're going to have church tonight. Right. Right. I'm going to see what God will do for me. I'm going to I'm going to open myself up to Him doing a miracle for me. I'm not going to walk in all squished together like, oh, I don't know if I can handle this again. No, I'm going to open my arms and say, Lord, I'm building this bond between me and you. Now you show me. You do miracles for me. And it's going to build this bond even closer, even stronger between me and you. Oh, Brother David, didn't he do a miracle for you while you're in church and not having to worry about going to work this morning? Were you willing? Oh, yes. He'd even ask for it. He had asked for a miracle. And then his boss called him up and said, you can come Monday. You don't have to come Sunday. Hallelujah. Praise God. A miracle. And she sat because I know you wanted to go to church. Come on. Come on. Woo. Glory to God. Be willing. Get me ready. Be open. Amen. Be open. Went and prayed for the sister Yvonne with the same problem she's having now. And, and the Holy Ghost came on me and about scared her off the bed. <laughs> but he did it, didn't he? He healed her. You got you just open yourself up and say, You healed me before, I'm believing you to heal me now. Yes. I'm not gonna squinch up and say, Oh, it's pitiful, I'm not gonna have any help. I'm not gonna do that. Right. I'm gonna open myself up for miracles from you. Hallelujah. He did a miracle for David. What was that, Sister Linda? David cast a stone and it killed the giant. Was that a miracle? I mean, how could that possibly be? It was a miracle. David opened himself up for miracles. He stepped up and said, I'll fight the giant. It was a miracle that he survived fighting a bear. It was a miracle that he survived fighting a, a, lion, a lion for his lamb, but he did it anyhow because he stepped up and believed that God could provide a miracle for him because he had some bonds already built and he was building an even stronger bond of miracles. 
It was a miracle God saved my husband. He's in heaven because I opened myself up for a miracle from him. And he loved Michael. I'm not saying anything about him not loving him. He did. But what I mean is, you are an instrument of God being able to do miracles if you are willing to build that bond between you and Him. Allow Him. Allow Him. Cornelius allowed Him. This is the example I brought. It's a, it's a good one, isn't it, in our church? This afternoon, I want you to meditate on coming to church and receiving the Holy Ghost. Cornelius didn't know what was going to happen. You don't either. You don't. You never been filled with the Holy Ghost. You don't know. Cornelius didn't know what was going to happen when Peter came. But Peter preached. He preached about Jesus to the Gentiles. And suddenly, the Holy Ghost came and filled all of them. Filled all of them in that room. They all began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. They were open. They were allowing God to do miracles for them. That was their building bond. That's how you establish a bond between you and God. Of course, there's probably many other things I haven't thought of. I'm just giving you four. I'll tell them to you again. Pray no matter what. Giving your tithe and your offerings. Lean on His Word. Get involved with His Word. And allow Him to do miracles for you. You know that woman that put TMP after each, all these verses? And the preacher that came and said, What does TMP mean? Because he borrowed her Bible. She said it means tried and proven. Well, I'm going to tell you this. This is tried and proven. I have a bond. I have a bond. You do too. But we're building it. We're making it stronger. When people see our lives, they know. They see that bond. It's not a counterfeit. It's not with some devilish religion. It's with the true Word of God. It's with the true Lord God Almighty and His Son and Holy Ghost. And it's for Him. It's for Him. Hallelujah. Pray no matter what. This morning you might not feel like praying. <laughs> How about it anyhow? Brother Cecil, you go wherever you're going. You can say, I prayed in Sister Linda's church this morning. She prayed for me and I felt the Spirit of the Lord touch me. He's, he's building that bond. We're, we've got a bond between us. If you don't have a bond, you want one. Or you don't have enough. You feel like, I kind of feel like I, he drops me or I drop him when I get in this situation or that situation. Come down and talk to him about it. Come down to this altar and say, Lord, I want a stronger bond. I want to feel a strong bond between me and you. I don't want it to be easily broken. I want it to be strong. Woo! Strong. Woo! No matter what happens. Woo! Woo! Go ahead, brother. Let him do miracles for you. Let him do miracles for you. Woo! Let him do miracles for you, Gloria. Like he did for Cornelius. Woo! Speak in tongues. Bill, you don't know it either. Tell him, Lord, I need that bond. I need that bond, Lord. 
my life. I open my life. I open my life for miracles. Oh Lord, you know. Give me a scripture to help me to know what you're going to do. Let me get more involved with your word. Put my hand in my heart. Let me get more involved with your word. Oh, let me, Lord, read your word and oh, take scriptures for my own. Let me believe that you're going to do that in me that I believe you for. Let me be like Abraham. Let me believe you no matter what. Let me be bound to you, Lord. Bound to you. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. You know, he said we're bought with a price. We're not our own. Isn't that wonderful? Some people say, no, that's not wonderful. I want to be my own. No, you don't. You want to belong to Him. Woo! You're bought with a prize. You want to belong to Him. You want to belong to Him. Let me belong to you. Let me belong to you. Let me belong to you. Let me feel that bond between me and you. Lord, my Lord, I open my life to you for miracles. My She sing bind us together. Bind me and you together. We'll tell him. Bind me and you together, Jesus. Let us be in the same yoke. Let us be yoked together. That's what he said. Oh, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. That's a bond between you. His yoke upon your life. My Lord, let your yoke be over my heart. Be over my mind. Over my soul. Lord, don't let me try to be an individual. Or just my own anymore. But let me be bound. Oh, bound to you. Just let him touch you, brother David. Let him shake you.
Dear Jesus, abide with me. Live with me, Lord.